Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk. It's a Saturday morning. Great to be with you and our lines will be open on the show. We do hope you'll keep us company and of course we are with you till 10 o'clock. Great to be with you. Uh, but on this morning's show, we have some very serious issues that we're going to be talking about. We're looking at issues around abused men and abused boys with matrix men. And we're also going to be talking to Tahia Hassam about the New Beginnings Haven. It's a haven for abandoned babies. And we'll wrap up by talking with author Daryl Ilbury about the quiet maverick. And that, of course, is none other than Tim Noakes and the whole issue around the Banting diet or the Banting revolution. So all of that and more coming up to keep us company and let's get to the heart of the matter and that is Matrix Men. Who are they? Why has the support group been formed? So let's get to the interviews. Martin Powders, good morning. Welcome to the show. Morning, Julie. Thanks so much for the invite. We really Lovely to have it. you here. Great. And Hungani Ndlovu. Yes. Welcome to the show, and I guess it's also welcome to Matrix Men. Yeah, kind of uh, officially. <laughs> Thank you very much. Brilliant. Let's start off with you, Martin, and ask the all-important question. Matrix Men is the name of your organization. Yes. What's the meaning of Matrix? Well, Matrix, you have um, there's four types of Matrix. So there's a geological, a medical, and a mathematical. There's a no, fourth, I can't. It eludes me now. And I'm also wondering Sorry. why you've chosen uh, Matrix Men to be your brand name yes. for an organization dealing with abused men and abused boys. Yeah, good question. Uh, we chose to go with Matrix because of what it symbolizes. Um, so if we look at the geological, so if, uh, well, let's start with the medical matrix is actually a womb. So a woman's womb with a baby inside is a matrix. So it's something that covers. Um, of course, the mathical, mathematical one is the one everybody remembers with the numbers that cascade True. down like that. Mm. But then a geological matrix is, is a, a rock. So from the outside, it's this very dark, very hard rock. But when you break it open, inside of it, there's a lot of gems. There's like crystals and varying colors, um, depending on the type that you find. And that's, I kind of saw and that precious. as a- precious, gems are precious. Are precious, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I saw that as a symbolism of what uh, survivors of abuse are, you know, especially men, because we're, we're not given the emotional skills to deal with this sort of thing. So men have a couple of ways to deal with anger, uh, with, with uh, pain, and that's by anger, uh, addiction, alcohol, um, sex is one of those things. So we turn to all these dysfunctional ways of coping with this instead of dealing with it properly. And we develop a hard shell around ourselves, you know, around our hearts. And eventually when you finally crack that shell open, you get these gems, these precious people inside. Who are asking are for a second shine. chance in life and Absolutely. who also are crying out to be held, to be hugged and to be loved That's because they feel want. absolutely tarnished. Yeah. They feel that they are spoiled merchandise. And worthless. Mm -hmm. and worthless. Hungani, you're very young and I'm wondering why you have committed to become involved and support an organization like The Matrix Men. You've also told me that you are an actor by yes. profession. Yes. Um, yes, I am an actor. And um, being being part of Matrix Men, um, geez, I mean, like like we've just said, it's like it's a real topic, it's a real issue that we have, which is kind of not really focused on. Um, and with the platform that I have, I felt I could join Martin and and make this um, this awareness thing more more real, and so that people can can face these things and talk about it. Because if we don't talk about it, well, then what's going to happen? You're going to have a lot of broken men, yeah, uh, and a broken society, obviously. And you are wanting also to add your voice, and you're yeah. wanting to show the world that it's not only white boys and white men, mm -hmm. but this is something that doesn't discriminate. Anybody can become a victim of sexual 
abuse at any stage in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing that you also want to highlight, both you guys sitting here in front of me, is that um, there's this notion that cowboys don't cry, real men don't cry, but real men also suffer pain and they do cry and they should cry. Yeah, we cry internally, you know. I think um, I never shed physical tears, but I think emotionally I was, I was screaming in pain, you know. Um, attempted suicide four or five times starting at 16. And this is simply because you were and you were a victim of sexual abuse. I was a victim from of a very abuse early age. From, yeah. Tell us how did it start? Yeah, well there's certain things I don't disclose. Um, Obviously, so we, we, yeah. we respect that. So, um, but at the age of four or five I remember being used by people. Um, a woman performing oral sex on me and things like that and they unfortunately because of the young age they just flashes just very sort of a glimpse of a memory but then it went on to um, at the age of eight nine ten where I was molested by several different different people and then carried on raped at 12 and then from 13 onwards was used by one person. When you talk about the abuse having started at age five, surely this must have been people close to you, yeah. immediate family members, sadly. Sadly, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, it's, um, I, I kind of grew up in life not having a good basis, you know, um, learning all the wrong things, you know, learning that love was sex. And you grow up through life going, you know, uh, love is actually an emotional connection with another special person in your life. So, you know, uh, that's what it should be. But to me, it was always looking for, you know, if I didn't get sex, it, I wasn't loved. And so that was my constant quest in life. So um, we talk about sex addiction and that's sort of what I had, you know. I was constantly looking for the physical contact to affirm myself because I had such a low esteem of myself. I didn't care for myself at all, you know. And um, so you go through life looking for these things and unfortunately it's, it's a vicious cycle because when you do have a conquest, when you do have sex with somebody, there's no, the emotional contact is still missing. It's just, an, it's just a, a meeting of two people and you start feeling worse. So it actually gets worse and worse and worse. The and void it and the emptiness. Yes, yeah, you just, the hole becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. Let's look at the issue around anger, because surely having been abused from a very early stage and age of your life, there must have come a time in your life when you were really, really angry at the whole world. And you probably wanted to lash out. How did you lash How did you vent all of that anger and the despair and the frustration? Yeah. I started, I think, initially I started binge drinking at the age of 13. So I would go through a weekend. All the wrong ways of venting. All the wrong ways of venting, yes. So, of course, we, a broken people attract one another. So you end up with other broken souls, and together you find these ways of coping. And they're not always good, you know. So that's why you end up with a group of people that are into drugs, because they're just finding a way to cope together. You know, I don't judge people. If a guy's an addict, there's a reason why he's an addict. If he's an alcoholic, there's a reason why he's an alcoholic. No, and I'd rather look at them and go, what is the reason? Why did you start using? What hurt you so much that you felt the need to be able to uh, sort of vent your frustrations in drugs, alcohol, anger, violence, you know, sex, rape, that sort of thing. And um, so I started at 13, I started binge drinking every weekend. Uh, then came the suicide attempts. I tried churches. I walked to a church and I remember it was, I was so angry. I went to the church and I was really just looking for guidance and help and somebody to speak to. And all the doors were locked on the church. And I remember turning around. I mean, it was, I think it was a Wednesday afternoon. And I turned around and said, God, you don't exist. I hate you. And I walked away, you know, and that anger just escalated. And uh, then we just, the drinking got worse. And, you know, the anger got worse. I was never the type of person who would actually go out and f pick a fight. I've never actually physically struck anybody in anger. It's just words, and words can be far more damaging, you know. So when I finally managed to get myself a wife, uh, I was I just vented that anger on her, and uh, took it out on her and blamed her for all the problems in the world, and you know, and it just it got worse and worse and worse, and um, you just end up at a point in your life where 
there's so much despair and you just think of yourself as such an ugly person because you're always so and angry. And the shame and that's the shame attached that to what has happened yes. to you. Ungani, your story, you know, I always say people get attached to a specific organisation mm -hmm. because um, they've had some form of experience or they know someone who's been affected in a certain way and they believe that they want to be involved because they want to make a difference. Yeah, well, um, my story kind of begins in high school. So I went to boarding school um, here in Johannesburg, actually. And um, that's where, like, bullying kind of began for me um, in grade eight. And I never really had a, a way of, like, speaking about it because the people that I spoke to kind of made the situation worse. So, yeah, kept all of that kind of inside and as time lapsed within the years because of the hierarchy in the school and the system and how it works, I myself began to do the same things that were done to me to the lower grades as I grew older, um, which at that point I didn't really like realize was a problem because I was like, well, this is how things work. You know, you're going to experience it and then you're going to dish it out. But after leaving high school, um, I went to the United States um, to study there. And um, whilst I was there, I got into a relationship and um, things went kind of south and we kind of got physical for about six months whilst we were together. And not for one second did we think of leaving each other. And that's only because we were both in it and somehow felt we would overcome it at some point. But had someone like Martin been there to be like, guys, actually, this is very toxic for you guys. Um, it's not good. Uh, we would have maybe realized sooner to leave each other and not get physical. But we got to that point because we had no one to tell us that we would physical get Physical abuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally have not been sexually abused, but I've encountered a mu like numerous occasions of physical abuse. Yeah. What about verbal abuse? Does this fall into the same category? Any Someone, you, you're in a relationship and there's a lot of verbal abuse all of the time. Yes. What sort of flag should be going up? What's that telling you about the relationship? I always say to young people that get into relationships, the minute you start changing to make the other person happy is the time you leave. When that person says, if you only surely, dress this way, we, I'd, I'd love you more. Or if you only did this, if you only did that, it's, it's never going to change. But Leave. when you talk about change, surely if the person has a bad habit, whatever the habit is, maybe they don't speak properly, maybe they uh, swear a lot in discussion, etc. And if you're wanting those type of changes, that oh, should be okay. Yes, yes, that's okay. You know, but if I keep coming to you and saying, uh, I don't like the way you dress, you look slutty, you know, um, so why did you start dating me in the first place? Because that's what I wore, you know? Or if uh, a person comes to you and, say, is, and keeps telling you that you're lazy or that what you did was stupid, and it's a repetitive thing, you know? I mean, if you're encouraging somebody to improve themselves, there's a way of doing it. But when you're breaking somebody down, it's, that's a different thing. Yeah. So if I come to you and I want to encourage you and I say, you know what, you're really awesome, and the way you speak is fantastic, but if you only enunciated the words a little bit better, let me help you. Would you mind? You know, that sort of thing. That is a different way, you know. But when you come to it, it's like you speak like an idiot. You know, why do you speak like that? I mean, you don't pronounce things properly. What's wrong with you? You know, that starts becoming abusive. And it's always nice. I mean, we find with a lot of people that uh, the first few months of the relationship, wow, the guy is like a saint or the girl is like a saint. <laughs> yeah, it's your best yeah. behavior. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? You're trying to impress. You're working hard to impress. You're working hard to impress and you're luring that person in mm. and luring that person in until eventually you feel you've got them. But they test the bounds. They're constantly testing. And that boundary keeps moving. So it starts with, I don't like your shoes. You know, why don't you change them? You know? And then he goes, oh, well, she listened to me there. Uh, Next thing, I don't like those pants, you know, why don't you rather wear a dress? And then that happens, then it, it escalates. And that's the same, I mean... Um, you talked about grooming in a previous discussion of ours. Yes. Um, you also indicated that because you've been uh, abused from a very early age, you then reached a point in your life and you decided to do something about it, to 
take back your life, yes. to become a victor rather than a victim. victim. Mm. How did that process, uh, but before you respond to that uh, question, I need to ask you this very important question. There's a theory out there which suggests that people who are abused almost ask for it. You attract the oh, abuse. Yes. How do you respond to something like that? What Absolutely. is it about your body language yes. that is supposedly attracting someone, um, you know, abuser into mm. your life? You know, I, I started thinking that I had sort of victim or idiot tattooed across my, my forehead at one point. Because it just, you know, when you speak to people, sometimes healthy people can't think this way. So when you speak to a lady and she goes, you know, I was raped four times. Then they go, Yo, you know, once. Okay, but four times? You really? asked for it. You asked for it, you know. That's, that's the general, um, absolutely. you know, thinking out there. Yes, absolutely. But what unfortunately happens is that perpetrators are well versed in what they do. They train all their lives to do what they do. And I mean, we, let's just take for example now, we, uh, we, we are busy with four cases. There's a case in Eldorado Park. There's a case in Scottsville in Peter Maritzburg. There's a case, of course, in Johannesburg, Parktown Boys, and there's a case in uh, Georgia at the moment that we're working on. There's another one that we're busy investigating in, in Cape Town. But between the four, Cape, uh, before, uh, between the four uh, uh, cases that we're busy with now, there are, let me just quickly count. And 30, those are the only four that are high profile that have come to your attention. High profile. The one has actually been through trial. The guy's been convicted and nobody even knows the case happened. And this is what's beginning to upset me. You know, this is where I'm going, hang on a second. The Eldorado Park, he was a cycling coach, uh, Mr. And uh, I think his name is Anderson. He raped eight boys. In Scottsville, the school counselor raped 10 boys. And the boys were aged five to 13. In Parktown, there's 22 victims. Down in George, it's one guy that we know of that already two victims have come forward. So between those cases, we have, uh, do the maths, that's 30, 40, 42 victims and four perpetrators. So they're going to go on abusing for the rest of their lives. They are. And the victims, if you don't get help, if you don't shout out and ask for help, you are going to be a victim for the rest of your Absolutely, life. Absolutely, because you, you, get, you get this look in your eyes and that's what I think it is. It boils down to that you have a look in your eyes that just pedophiles are attracted to that or abusers are attracted to that. They, they pick up that something. you're broken. Yes, they pick up that you're broken. And they hone in on you and they will start probing and just little movements and little suggestive ideas and things like that. And they, they lure you in that way. And they go around looking for broken people. And as I say, I mean, uh, Scottsville, the youngest victim was five. Oh. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Okay, let's take an ad break. When we get back, I want to ask what is grooming and what should parents be looking out for um, if their children are being abused, their boy children. We're talking to Martin Peldis and Hungani um, from uh, Matrix Men. It is a support group for abused boys and abused men. And yes, believe it or not, even grown men are being abused in this day and age and they just need to know that there is help out there. Lines are open, do call in. We'd love you to be a part of the conversation. And we're still going to be talking later on in the show, of course, our second interview is with um, a lady from New Beginnings and we'll be wrapping up by talking about uh, the silent or the quiet maverick, the story on Tim Noakes, a book written by Daryl Ilbury. So do stay with us. We're talking abuse, um, sexual and physical abuse against boys and men. And the guys talking to us are from an organization, a support group called Matrix Men. Martin Pelders and Hungani Ndlovo are the guys in studio with us. If you have any questions or comments, we're happy to take your calls. Hungani, the question around uh, the black community and when you talk about sexual abuse against boys and men. How is that accepted and what type of support can you expect the community to give you? Um, well, not just on sexual abuse, but just on abuse in general as males being victims is um, it's like a taboo. 
um, yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've had comments on our posts where people, black people have been like, really dude, black guys can get real. black, really? And, and that's the thing, because the way we grow up is where you're the man of the house, you're the head, you're the, you know, so that kind of person, there's, there's no way can be a victim. And, and that's the problem because we are and can be victims. And because we are not given the space or the voice to be able to deal with it, then we don't deal with it. And we have several cases where the men are abusing their wives or their girlfriends and so forth. Because so then you have this dysfunctionality, yeah. a kind of uh, creating a bigger and a bigger circle, yeah. affecting more and more people. Yeah. How many people or how big um, is your base of people that you're supporting? Are you surprised? Are you worried? Do you think that in this day and age we shouldn't be having so many people that are victims? Uh, I wish there were, weren't any victims, yeah. you know. Uh, when we look at it, you know, I started, when I started seven years ago, I used to phone into the radio stations or phone the press and try and get stories out there and things like that. And I mean, just seven short years ago, people were like, you're crazy, what are you talking about? Men don't get abused. So already we've made inroads and we started to raise awareness about this sort of topic. And we wish that, as I said before, nobody was abused. We wish it didn't exist, but unfortunately, man is just sinful and that's, what happens, that's what people do. And broken people uh, are, are just worse, you know, they, 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 the, the violence escalates. But our base at the moment is, is, is pretty small. Um, there's a couple of hundred guys that we're supporting. Hundred thousand? No, a couple of hundred. Oh. Yeah, a couple of hundred, I wish. Is at it because moment, men don't want to talk about they it? They don't want to talk about um, it. I'm going to be um, accused of having asked for it and I was not man enough to protect myself. There's, that's the thought that, that goes through your head, you know. I could have done something differently and it wouldn't have happened to me. If it's my only fault. I did, it's my fault, you know, that sort of thing. But more so, as you said earlier, um, cowboys don't cry. Um, society has this perception that if you forget about something, it'll go away. And sadly, it doesn't. Yeah. It kind of stays in your subconscious and it plagues you and it bugs you, yeah. you know. I mean, I did things subconsciously, like I would never stay in a job for longer than a year because I was afraid that my perpetrator would find me and then lure me back in again. And he did eventually when I was 37. He found out where I stayed, he got a hold of my phone number and he actually phoned me and it took just one word from him, hello. And I knew exactly who it was and that fear entered back into my mind again. What is it about perpetrators? What is it about them or what is it about the victim that they have such absolute control over the victims? Yeah, it's, there's, there's different ways of, of controlling, especially with younger victims, there's different ways of controlling. So fear is one. Mm -hmm. So um, if you tell somebody your mother will die or your father will die. Is this all part jail, of the grooming or, process? It's all part of the grooming process. Uh, the other one is like, uh, is love, false love, you know. So especially with boys. So when somebody touches a boy on his penis, he will get an erection. That, that's it. You know, there's nothing you can do. <clears throat> Currently, we have a case where there's three women that go around raping men. And the last case was in Pretoria, where they captured a man, or they kidnapped a man, essentially, drugged him, locked him up in a room and had sex with him. There were three of them, and they kept him for three days. And the comments, just this morning, I was responding to some of the ignorant comments that people put out there. Um, a man would never get erect if he wasn't attracted. You know, unfortunately, a man's body walks, works differently. If you touch that chappy, it's going to it's gonna respond. It will respond. It doesn't matter who you are, how ugly, how handsome, how pretty. It doesn't matter. It's, it works on sensation. And young boys probably feel that they, being, they are being loved. They, people care so deeply for them and they are special. Yes. And that is why they've been chosen, very especially in institutionalized uh, situations. Yes. I mean, we had the Sid Sidney Frankel case, you know, just uh, Mr. Frankel, a billionaire. He was seen as a, a great leader in the Jewish community, for instance, and he was involved with orphanages and he would get involved in those orphanages purely to abuse children. And he, he, he wasn't worried, it was boys and girls. I mean, there were, I think, eight or ten, eight, eight people came forward there. Uh, three of them were men, 
and the balance for a woman. Five, I think, for a woman. So he went around just to um, Then you get, for instance, Bob Hewitt, another uh, high-profile case. Well, the he tennis had star. The tennis star, who's currently sitting in jail down in the Eastern Cape somewhere. And uh, his, his preference was for young girls, you know. But the grooming process for boys, and uh, just come back to that, they use that, the fact that boys will get erect, and they say to him, see, you are enjoying it. You do like this. So the boy starts getting this confusing sort of input into his brain. My body responds, but I'm not enjoying it. I don't like what this guy's doing to me. And especially at a young age, because you're being pre-sexualized. I mean, boys will start getting sexualized at about the age of 12, 13, 14. That's when they start developing hair and things start happening in their bodies. Their voices start breaking, etc., etc. And that is about the time that boys start thinking about girls as attractive. You know, girls start a little bit before that. Now, when you pre-sexualize children, it causes a huge confusion in their lives. And that is what perpetrators use. So they say to the boys, look at you, you're enjoying that, you know, look at your body's responding. You know? Martin, for parents watching us this morning, and even young people, what, you know, what would be the signals for parents to look out for in their children to suggest that maybe my child is being, um, my child is a victim. Mm. What can they, what are the signs they ought to be looking out for and what can they do to prevent and protect these children? Okay, let's start with the most important thing. Is and here we're talking boys and girls now. Boys and girls, we don't discriminate, mm -hmm. really. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pandemic in this country, especially. I mean, research tells us that 44% of our boys in this country will be either raped or sexually abused by the age of 18. So we can get into arguments about the percentage. It could vary from 30 to 40. It doesn't matter. One is one too many. Um, so we can't sit and argue about the fact that more boys or more girls are being raped in this country. It doesn't matter. Children are being raped. That's what's happening. And sexually so, abused, and obviously. And sexually abused, yeah. So the first and most important thing for a parent to do is believe your child. If a child comes to, talking about weird sexual things, don't, don't turn around and think, well, this kid is a, a freak or something like that. They talk about that because something's happened to them. And if they say to my uncle is touching me in such a way, believe them. Kids will not make this sort of thing up. You know, believe your child. That's the most important. I think parents don't want to believe it because they don't want to admit that something horrendous has happened or is happening to my child. Exactly. And if um, there is a confrontation, it might create a breakup in the family. Yes. So there's a whole host of issues there's that they issues, consider yes. before they make that final, uh, take the final step in broaching the subject full on. Well, the most important thing, who is the most important person in your life? Your child. They're your child. Exactly. And let me tell you something, that if you don't pay attention to that child and give that child the support that they need, that child is going to grow up and be dysfunctional and crazy. You don't know what's going to happen to them. From there, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be weird, perverted lifestyles. It could be anything. That child is going to try and find love and attention and healing in its own way, and they're going to end up with the wrong people. But that doesn't say that anybody who's broken later on in life, uh, it doesn't mean that um, that person was necessarily sexually abused as a child. No, no, not necessarily. Um, but if we take like Kungani's case, where he was physically, uh, uh, you know, beaten bullied and bullied and abused, and abused by his girlfriend, um, it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't necessarily I mean it could be emotional and verbal abuse. It's the same thing, you know. Martin, there's also the issue where, you know, a parent has the suspicions that my child may be abused. We, we're not quite sure how, what sort of abuse is being perpetrated. And they are totally lost. They don't know what to do, who to go to, um, how to broach the issue. That's where Matrix Men and other such organizations come in, I mean, Teddy Bear Clinic, etc. Teddy Bear Clinic. You know, for Teddy Bear Clinic is great, but they're so overworked at the moment. So I would go to places like Childline, start the Childline, Lifeline, uh, that sort of area. You know, they have or Matrix bigger, Men for that matter. Matrix Men, if, but we focus only on boys. Mm -hmm. So yeah, contact us. Uh, we can get in touch with a forensic psychologist or child psychiatrist and they can start questioning and talking to the children in a non-offensive way to try and draw out what's happening. If we have any inkling 
that something is happening. We will then uh, go and do a, a medical examination where a forensic uh, a doctor that specializes in this sort of thing will then do an internal and external examination to see if there are any uh, scarring or anything like that. And we go from there, then open a case, approach the prosecutors, discuss the case, try and find more victims. Now, what about parents who believe that it might be a very costly um, mm. exercise for them? Would you support them through all of this? We'll help them, yes, all right. absolutely. You, you started Matrix I mean, seven years ago. Yes. How has it helped in your healing? I was very careful. Um, I was accused by somebody who said to me, I'm doing this just to heal. And I stepped back for a short time and I looked at, I started examining myself. And I thought, you know what, I can't go into this. And this is unfortunately what happens. A lot of people go into supporting other people as a healing process. And that to me is wrong. To me, you need to heal first and then use your experiences to help others. Mm -hmm. So Matrix Men helped me in terms of, I think it didn't help me in terms of my healing process. My healing process started before that. And I focused on me for like a good two years. I was very selfish and I cut myself off from the world and I just researched as much as I could. Did you undergo any counseling? Because I, I should imagine that is very important yes. as well. Yes. You know, that's another area. That's a, that's a huge issue, counseling. And that's something that we're busy working on at the moment is that a lot of therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists in this country don't know how to deal with this. They don't. You know, so what happens is you go off and you find yourself a psychologist and you start talking to them, you build up this relationship, and eventually you develop the courage and you think, oh, I trust this person enough to be able to drop this bomb. So you go in and you eventually pluck up the courage. Now you've been to 10 sessions and these sessions are costing you eight, 900 rand a shot. And then you say to the, the psychologist, you say, you know, um, I was sexually abused as a child. And you wait in. You, as the victim, you sit in there and watching that person, and the minute they do one thing wrong, if they blink at the wrong time, if they just move in their chair at the wrong time, if they just clear their throat at the wrong time, that's it, finished. The trust relationship is broken, and you then go and start the process again. So it's a case of trying to educate professionals on how to deal with this issue, because that seriously, you'd think that they'd know. Okay, we're uh, almost at the end of the interview. Mm. Um, I'd like to end on a positive note because I do believe that everybody deserves a second and subsequent chances and opportunities in life. Um, what I need to ask you is the all important question. Are you able to overcome? Can you heal? Can you become almost okay, normal, whatever the right terminology would be and go on, pick up the pieces and have a good life? Uh, absolutely. I think you have two men here that are living proof of that. Yay to that. <laughs> yes. You know, just, just, just finally, the power of suggestion. It is often said that uh, people can suggest to you, you go in for counselling for other issues, and then the counsellor then suggests that maybe you're a broken person because you were abused as a child. You don't remember, you have no memories of it, but because Thanks. they're suggesting it, you start believing that, yes, I was a victim of abuse. There's a way of doing it. So I wouldn't go out and openly suggest that, oh, perhaps you were sexually abused as a child. I would go and ask the, 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 the patient to go and investigate their past and then come back to you and say, so have a look at it and then ask them questions around. So for instance, I was going through AA and I was doing a step four and the guy started asking funny questions through step four, they broke it down into further sections. And he started asking funny sex, uh, questions about um, doing sexual acts with dogs. And I read this thing and I thought that's I stupid. All, uh, yeah. But it triggered something yeah. in my head. Mm -hmm. And There's, I've got to stop you there. Yes. Lots of sick people out there Absolutely. and sick suggestions and sick notions. But to end on a very positive note, um, what can we leave our viewers with? And I know that you do have a website as well that they can go to. So yes. what is it that you want to say to them? Well, we'd uh, like to just encourage all parents that have children to firstly speak to your children and don't discriminate. Boys and girls are raped in this country. Just be open with them, talk to them, allow, create that atmosphere where they're able to come and talk to you, where they feel that they can trust you with any question or any problem. So please, please speak to your children. And um, yeah, I mean, anybody can overcome. It's, it's tremendous. Your final thoughts? 
Um, to leave on a positive note, I would say as, as people, we just need to spread authentic love. And um, yeah, that's, that's Be true. strong, take care of yourself and yeah. be positive in every, um, every interaction that you possibly can. Yeah. There you have it, um, men talking about issues around being abused uh, physically and of course sexually as well as boys and they've now grown into men. There is a support group if you believe you have, if you're still battling with this issue and um, you don't know where to turn to, then you can go to the Matrix Men website, try and get as much information and support as you possibly can. You don't need to suffer in silence. Still to come, we'll be talking to New Beginnings and we'll be wrapping up by talking with Daryl Ilbury about the book The um, uh, Quiet Maverick. Stay with us. And welcome back. We're now going to be talking about the New Beginnings um, Foundation or the New Beginnings uh, Home, which uh, caters for abandoned babies. So we do hope that you're going to become a part of the conversation by calling in, sharing your thoughts with us, and hopefully be in line to adopt a baby. They have lots of babies and children who are up for adoption, inshallah. And do remember the last interview of this morning is The uh, Quiet Maverick. It's the story of uh, Tim Noakes and the Banting Revolution. It's written by Daryl Ilbury, and he is the man that we have actually interviewed. But right now we have the lovely Tahia Hassam, who runs New Beginnings, and she's going to tell us all about it. Salaamu Alaikum. Thank Lovely to have me. you here. Thank you for having me. You have a huge, huge job, do you not? You're mommy to a whole host of abandoned babies. Not just abandoned, abandoned and abused and special medical needs babies. But yes, they're all my little ones. How do they land up um, at your center? Well, we have various ways though, that, that the babies and the toddlers come in. So it's either through police stations, hospitals, social workers, or even biological moms who bring in their, their children for care. Okay. How long ago did you start the foundation? New Beginnings, I started in 2001, and then the Baby Haven we opened in Laudium in 2009. So you operate from Laudium? Yes, we do. What about Sunnyside? There's a, a hole in the wall for abandoned babies? Yeah, it's called the Baby Wall. We've actually got two in Sunnyside now, um, one in 4th Street and then one in, um, well, on the corner of Mears and Jorison Street. So we operate through the entire Gauteng region and sometimes we also have referrals from neighboring provinces as well. But the, the office and the home is situated in Laudia. I've been very fascinated because I spoke to someone a long while ago also about, um, you know, babies that get left um, either on the doorstep of a, of a church or a, or a home. But there's also this hole in the wall where babies are left. And I always wondered, oh, goodness me, will the babies not be hurt when they left? Just explain the concept to us and let's just, for other people who might be as worried as I was, understand that it's a very safe little environment that you've created. How does it work? So basically it's like a big mailbox. It's big enough to accommodate up to a three-year-old, um, the one in, in Jorison Street. And the new one we built is slightly smaller because that area is, is purely for abandoned newborns that are found in the felt or in the river, in the little stream next to, to the wall. So what happens is a mom basically opens the door or the person dropping off the baby, places the baby on the little blanket that's provided there. There's a sensor inside the, the baby wall that then alerts the the person on duty inside the house, which then comes out, fetches the baby, gives me a call and I go and fetch the baby. On average, how many babies do you get in a month? It doesn't actually work per month. Um, we have our busy seasons, for instance, Christmas and New Year, and then sometimes we're quiet for months on end. But during our busy season, we usually we can get up to maybe a baby a day. Oh, OK. How many children do you have uh, at the center currently? We registered for 30 children between the ages of zero to five years. Mm -hmm. 
Huge task, is it not? It is. Uh, let's talk about all of the people, and I know that you single-handedly started um, the Haven and the Centre, but there are lots of other people that work together with you to create a very safe and a loving environment for these abandoned and obviously um, children that and babies that just need love, care and a home. Yeah, absolutely. As, as much as I have the, the heart and the passion for this and I have the, the drive and the commitment for this, without my team, none of this would be possible. We all have, I think, a special calling in life and it, it shows in terms of the work that we do, all the programs that we run, all the rehabilitation work. And it, it all starts with that little baby coming in and the trauma that that child has been through. So my staff are all trained and mentally and emotionally equipped to build that trust with that little baby because before we can teach children anything, we have to teach them to love. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? By Just, loving them? Yes, by loving them. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and showing them, you know, that, that there are people who care about them and a lot of the time with the babies that come in, they have such a feeling of rejection from the womb already. And those babies are a little bit more difficult. Um, similarly with the, the children or the babies that are drug and alcohol addicted when we get them in. It's just patience and perseverance and just feelings of, of love that you portray through to that little one every time you hold them or kiss them or sing to them. Yeah, but it's a whole process. And the babies with disabilities, I'm sure that's a little more difficult because you're having to spend more time and uh, special care around them. It depends on the severity of the disability and also the, the nature of the, the disability. But we do take in many of the cases that other places of safety refuse to take in because they simply just don't have the, the knowledge or the skills or the resources. And we also didn't initially, but it's just through, through you know, study and um, courses and things like that that you learn how to work with these children to be able to, of, to offer them the best opportunities in life and see them as normal and not disabled. How long is it that you're running the centre? The Baby Haven in Bengal Street is open since 2009. Mm -hmm. But before that I was doing it from home. So mm -hmm. we've, but we've had the, the big facility that we are so fortunate to have since 2009. And from home, how long have you been running it? From home, we looked after babies from 2004. So it was about five years before we started the Haven. And from the time that we started the Haven up until now recently, we're sitting at almost 500 children that have passed through our doors and benefited oh, from our services. When you talk about 500 children having passed through your doors, I often wonder about the issue around adoption. There are lots of uh, women that have been married for years and you know feel that they can't have children themselves naturally for whatever reason and adoption might then be they, they, they hope and wait and pray that a miracle will happen and if it just doesn't happen then they come to the realization that perhaps they should adopt. How open is our community to adoption and are you getting more and more requests from around us the immediate community? There's a lot of requests for adoption, but unfortunately the reality is because the Indian community is such a close-knit community, if there are babies um, that, that come from crisis pregnancies, they're usually kept within the families. So there are very, very few Indian and white babies available for adoption um, to couple, couples who are willing to adopt or looking to adopt. So it's a long waiting list, unfortunately. And the other children obviously suggest then they are black babies. Black, mixed race, mm -hmm. sometimes coloured babies, but for instance in, in the past nine years we've only had three Indian and three white adoptions, so it is... Or three babies, uh, six babies, and then they were taken up immediately yes, for adoption. Yes, and most of these babies are matched already, you know, before they even come to us, because again the waiting list is so long, but which actually makes it sad because with a lot of the people that I speak to, um, the, the prospective adoptive couple will, for instance, say, you know, it's, it's not us that will have a problem with a black baby, but it's the family. And I have a huge issue with that because at the end of the day, who's walking in that couple's shoes? It's not the family, they all have their children. So to deprive this couple of the opportunity to be amazing parents and provide the most loving and stable home for this little baby, I mean, 
it, it just doesn't make sense that you would be so blind to skin color when that dream is possibly within your grasp right here and now. Mm -hmm. And you're missing out. Absolutely. So you said 500 up to now, at least 500 babies and children have gone through the haven. Uh, that obviously means, alhamdulillah, that you were able to successfully place them in homes with loving adoptive parents. Um, are these locally or do you do international adoptions as well? Unfortunately, not all of those figures are um, babies that went for adoption. The, the government's sort of main mandate is family preservation and reunification. So a lot of the children that we get in, unfortunately, go back to sometimes exactly the same situations they were removed from in the first place, which makes our jobs very difficult because you've spent months or years trying to heal this child and now they go, they go back to that same environment they were removed from. So, yes, we do have babies that, that are adopted both locally, nationally and internationally. And very few of those babies do actually have the opportunity to go international. And it's usually the children that are HIV positive and have special medical needs. It, it just seems that a lot of the local parents are not willing to take on a child with special needs, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It is a huge responsibility. Um, you know, sadly, we don't like seeing this playing out in our communities or on our doorstep, but it really is a huge responsibility to take on a child like that. And I think it's really very special parents, special people that would take something on like that. Mm. No, How do you guys at The Haven cope then with these special needs children? We, we don't see them as special needs children. I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, we, we challenge them and we, we enable them and we capacitate them to see themselves also as not disabled or special needs. So it's, again, just with training and experience, it, it makes a big difference. Have you had any children ever that started from a very early age from couple of months old and still with you five, eight, ten years later? Absolutely. We have a few of them actually mm -hmm. that started with us as newborn babies or a few hours old. Um, my smallest little one was 1.8 when we got her and she's in grade two this year. Mm -hmm. So it yes, becomes a part of your extended family, does oh, it absolutely. not? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those are my babies. They and they call me mummy as well. So for them there's there's no other family. This is the only thing that they know. What's the future going to be like for them? Let's assume at this point in time they've not been adopted as yet. They may not get assimilated into their own natural families. You they're going to be living with you now for the rest of their days till they then go on to become independent and move out. How are you how are you dealing or thinking about that situation going forward? It's a very good question. We are actually in the planning phases of our New Beginnings Children's Village and it's a mammoth fundraising task at the moment and we need to fundraise at least six million rand to build this new village and it is also particularly to make sure that we provide these few children that have grown up with us and are part of our family to have a home of their own and not be thrown back into the system and fall through the cracks because our social services actually is, is lacking. And I cannot see the children that we've raised all of these years to just become nothing and nobody, a number on a file with another organization. So. New Beginnings Children's Village in the planning phases. Inshallah, we do hope that it comes to fruition. So basically the whole idea is that there will be continuity or if they can stay with you till they become independent at age 18, maybe go out, possibly further their studies and then go out into the world and stand on their own two feet, which means that you've then reared them from cradle up to the time that they become independent. Because if that doesn't happen, you are right, there is a possibility that these kids get lost to, um, to society, so to speak. Absolutely. And I mean, with, with even your own children, I mean, People always say until they become 18 and they're independent, but I mean, look at our children at home. I mean, many of them are over 18 and they're still at home. And it's, it's good to have that support system and to have that family environment. And I think that that would only sort of ensure that they grow up to be stable 
um, adult and that they contribute to society instead of just you know standing on the street corner with a little board saying please help no money no food or applying for a grant and that was not the purpose you know with which we started new beginnings it was to make a difference, but a meaningful difference. And to walk the journey with these children, um, like I said, they are my babies. Whether I gave birth to them or not doesn't mean I love them any less, but it, it would definitely be in their best interest, you know, to stay on with us and, and have that family setting and that environment to grow up with. All right, let's take a, a call. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum to you, Amina. Welcome and thank you for calling in. What's on your mind? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and assalamu alaikum to the sister as well. Uh, Abaduli, actually, um, this is a better way actually to go than um, people aborting their children, even though it's not a good way either. Uh, I feel a mother should have the love for her child that she's given birth to and, and actually look after her own child. But we ask Allah to make it easy for all. And those children are actually brought into this home. That Allah Ta'ala make it easy for them as well. Uh, in fact, a while back, I actually wrote an article to the Rising Sun with regards to abortion. Because abortion is also murder. We're taking away the right of that child of actually getting an opportunity to live in life. And uh, these are the type of things that brings the wrath of Allah on us. And, and that's what I actually um, put a... Um, I'll say Mubarak to the lady who's actually doing the great work. May Allah give her the strength to carry on Absolutely. with what she's doing. Absolutely. And Lisa was much more than what she was doing, inshallah. Absolutely. These are the angels of communities but and I'll societies. So thank you indeed for your call. I would actually love to contact her and maybe if I can give my contact number. We never right. know if we can work together, inshallah. Please, in please leave your number with the producers and they'll pass it on to her at the end of the show. Shukran for calling in. Assalamu alaikum. Wa salam. It takes a special kind of person to do the type of work that you're doing. Um, not all of us have the um, strength, the courage and the resolution to do this type of work. It's a huge task. What drives you? I don't see it necessarily as that. I think um, we were all placed on this earth for a reason. And I mean, yes, it... it it's, it's difficult to say that it takes a special person. It does. <laughs> trust, I, <laughs> trust me when I say it takes a special person mm. to be able to give unconditional love mm. to abandoned, broken children. I can't do it. Um, I so guess we it's, it's, all, really, it's, it's really special. No, I think we were all just given, given our certain little <laughs> gifts in life. And um, as easy as you are in front of the camera, I am with my children. So. But it is truly special. Mm. Where do you find the resolve from, the strength to carry on from day to day? There must be times when you wonder and you ask yourself, why am I doing it? When you have a challenge, obviously. Absolutely. There are many days um, that we feel like that. And, and you sit back and you think, is this really all worth it? Like, is this at the end of the day really making a difference? And it's in particularly when we have those children that get placed in the back in those same horrible circumstances, for instance. And... You have to focus on the positive. It's, it's not always possible, but you have to remind yourself of all your success stories and of all the, the children that had no hope. And for instance, some of the babies that get released to us from hospital um, care and long-term hospital admissions. And the doctors basically just say, take them home so that they can die in, in a homely <sighs> environment. And those children are thriving. You know, it's, it's not just the medical part, it's not just, it's the whole basket of services that, that we provide. And above all, it's that, like you say, that unconditional love, that, that caring, that I think that, that motivates us, the success stories. Now, Tahir, you come from a Muslim background, obviously you're Muslim. What's the haven like? And obviously, I'm sure you don't discriminate and you take it in any color, creed or religion. Uh, but in the home, and especially those little kids that was, you know, that you got from the age of, well, from the time they were little babes, mm. and they're now growing up, um, surely they need some sort of religious direction, guidance, and um, 
focus what how do you prepare them then for these uh, you know for for their journey through life <laughs> Look, as far as spirituality is concerned we we very sort of open minded about that and although they are brought up and raised with muslim values it's uh, per law we are not allowed to enforce any particular religion on them however like their driving duas and their eating duas and their kalimas and things those little things we which do which are instill. universal anyway alhamdulillah yes. so we and obviously we only do halal and you know we 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 make sure that the children are exposed to islam as much as possible however we welcome other church groups as well who come and do little in, little interactional days with them and we have hindu groups and tamil groups and i mean it's islam is not just about you know thinking you are right and your way is right it's about encouraging you know that understanding and that compassion for humanity for, yes exactly Absolutely. so we welcome all religions islam but is a way of life there so we go. you know when you look at it universally it can apply to any given situation and circumstance and if those kids are given that foundation alhamdulillah they have got the greatest grounding in life whichever path they then take as they That's move on That's what we're hoping for absolutely Let's look at your benefactors because without them you wouldn't be able to be you know running this haven as successfully as you are mm -hmm. um they must be truly supportive i'm not sure if you're you know at liberty to mention names or organizations and how dependent you are on them to make your everyday life possible for these children that you are housing if if you would allow me to name them Please. i would gladly name them <laughs> so yes we we unfortunately do not well i wouldn't say unfortunately but we do not get any government funding whatsoever so we are heavily dependent on private and corporate sponsorship and some of our biggest funders include us oh, there's so many i hope i don't leave anyone out but um kinderfonds mamas which is also an ngo and they operate from holland um vodacom for instance shamil jusup family trust um Mashallah. office innovations you know um neighborly needs the sensef also at some points do you know liaise with us very very um valuably um sure there's there's so many of them countless but alhamdulillah countless, but we appreciate each and every single contribution i mean there's even an, an elderly lady who sets aside a, a certain portion of her pension money each oh, month wow. and after three months she will like phone us and say to here like what do you need my darling let me know and it gives her such great joy to like take that little savings of hers go and buy two or three packs of nappies or wet wipes and bring that and spend some time with the children you know so it's not necessarily just the the big sums of money that that we get in but it's it's those little heartfelt donations that mean the world to us not just in terms of of financial contribution but also in terms of time and expertise you know people um lawyers doctors pediatricians we welcome any and all kind of assistance as it really does make a big difference with about 3 minutes to wrap up time this huge project that you're talking about the village um have you started getting plans off the ground have you started interacting with people um expressing your views about the building of this uh, village how far down the line are you with it We are actually quite far. It's we're just at the point now where we actively need to start fundraising. So, um the plans have been drawn up and prepared. There's a few alterations and additions that we have to make, but it's it's really far along in terms of the planning phase. It's it's just now starting to raise the funds. Okay, so the fundraising is going to start soon inshallah. What motivates to here with 2 minutes to go to get involved in project in this project and you've been doing it for a long time? from 2004 2001 there you go so <laughs> it's a long long time mm. what drives you what motivates you what makes you put your heart and soul into this project so basically new beginnings was started after a horrific car crash and we lost our little boy zamir and that is what the the capital z in new beginnings is for so it's it's in memory of him Okay. You have uh the Zamir Hassan Foundation as well. How does that tie in with the Haven? It's just little extra special projects that projects that we do in terms of rat bite victims, um you know, mothers who still need to go to school and they fell pregnant in school. Um but yeah, it's it's a whole lot of different little projects that that we do under that umbrella. 
It's very difficult for you to talk about yes, this, is it, is it not? <laughs> I'm so sorry. sorry. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue giving you the courage to carry on and um, the strength because it can't be easy. And just go on touching lives in the beautiful way that you do and lots and lots of ongoing success with the Haven because you're doing it um, from the bottom of your heart for an amazing, amazing cause and you are touching so many lives and we can wish and pray for nothing more for you than you so being the angel of mercy <laughs> that you are and that's where we leave it. Shukran so much for being with us and um, Salaamu Alaikum to you. Alaikum Salaam. That was Tahia Hassam talking about the Zamir Hassam Foundation, new beginnings and what it is that motivates her to go out and touch lives, hundreds, hundreds of lives in a very positive way. She has new beginnings, a haven for children, it doesn't matter how old they are, there is a space and a place in her heart for each and every child that comes across that threshold. We do hope that you've enjoyed that part of the interview. And if you feel that you can contribute in any way, even if you become a volunteer, then this is the place you want to be. Let's take an ad break. When we get back, we'll be talking with Daryl Ilbury about The Quiet Maverick. And we're into the final segment of the show this morning. We're going to be talking to Daryl Ilbury. He is the author of the book, The Quiet Maverick. And the book is all about the controversial Tim Noakes and the Banting Diet. Daryl is um, a scientific or a science journalist. He comes with over 30 years of experience in the media. Um, he's an editor, journalist, uh, broadcaster, and a whole host more. He's also authored a book called, um, I think it is A Fox's Tale. And now we're going to talk to him about The Quiet Maverick. Daryl, good morning. Welcome to the program. Morning, Julie. Thank you. Lovely to have you here. How different is uh, the book on Tim Noakes, uh, The Quiet Maverick, to A Fox's Tale? Well, they're both similar in the fact that they focus on mavericks. The first one of Fox's tale was uh, about my wife, who is a best-selling business author with Clem Sunter, the Fox trilogy, and, uh, and a world-renowned scenario strategist, and a bit of a different thinker. This was a little bit more of a uh, focus on science, which is my area of expertise. So the first one I needed to uh, present Chantelle and try and capture her voice. Uh, this book, uh, um, Tim Noakes, to Quiet Maverick, is more my voice and uh, my opinions and my research about Tim Noakes. The book centers around the controversy around Tim Noakes, the Banting Diet, and the infamous uh, Twitter responses that he had put out. Um, but it's also more, more than just Tim Noakes. How did you navigate through all of that? That's a good question. I, I wanted to make the book more about or as much um, about the reader as it is about Tim Noakes. It's easy to write about Tim Noakes. He's uh, been a friend of the media for over 40 years, so he understands how to communicate science. But I wanted to write more about the, the reader. So in other words, it's all about the reader, their relationship with science, their relationship with the media, and their relationship with what they consume, both from their plates and also in the media. So what I had to do is I had to bear in mind that the average reader is not going to be a specialist about human nutrition. Um, they are going to be eaters of food. They are going to be consumers of the media. So they're not going to be specialists. So I had to make sure that when I wrote it, I wrote it with that in mind. How did Tim Noakes himself respond to the book? I mean, after having gone through the trial and all of that media hype, uh, some of it um, positive, but most of it pretty negative at the time. Uh, the Health Professions Council as well got involved. It must have been a very trying time for Tim Noakes. How did he respond to the book? And I hope that that brought a bit of uh, a smile and probably faith in himself again after reading the book. 
Um, he's um, he was he was very open to the idea. I made him realize that it wasn't going to be a fluff piece. Um, but um, I've I've worked with him before. I've interviewed him before, and he was very confident and uh, apparently very confident in my abilities and my my expertise as a science journalist that I would present uh, a fair and balanced opinion. Um, but, and also to his credit, he never at any stage asked to read anything that I actually written, which is very strange for a scientist. Most scientists seem to be a little bit uh, reluctant when dealing with the media. Um, and most scientists I've interviewed have asked to see what I've written from the perspective of whether or not it's uh, completely accurate. And uh, that is something which I'm open to, just to make sure that what I've written is accurate. But at no stage was he sort of pushing to, to read what I've written. So I think the first time he read it was when it actually published and I gave him a copy. For people who don't get down to reading the book, we do hope that they're going to go out in their droves and get the book, of course, to get the backstory of what exactly happened um, as far as the uh, Twitter um, responses, etc., um, uh, you know, um, unfolded. But your sense, and I know there was a lot of research, has to be a lot of research that goes into writing a book or even writing an article for that matter. Your sense of um, the whole hype, the negativity around the diet and Tim's response on Twitter around the issue of um, the child being put or, or a baby or a child being put on a banting diet. I think what's important to bear in mind is the fact that because this um, supposedly, the, the, well, the case against uh, Tim Noakes was based uh, apparently, based on his apparent um, unprofessionalism in dealing with social media, I think what's important to bear in mind is the fact that um, the HBCSA have no guidelines as to how a health professional should interact on social media. And a lot of this is about um, an inability of, uh, of the Health Professions Council to even understand what social media is all about. Uh, social media is an engaging platform. It's not something where someone goes on and says something and expects no response. Um, and what makes it social is the fact that it has a, um, a, a feedback mechanism. Um, and that's either support or it's rebuke. And because there is that support mechanism, because there's a feedback mechanism, I should say, is that you can't really see social media as if it's someone who is, let's say, for example, giving a talk. Uh, if someone gives a talk and they stand up and they present an, an opinion then and people can challenge them, then we need to understand the fact that though there's the, that, that feedback mechanism. And that is key to social media. And it became apparent to me right from, from the early part of this whole trial that the HBCSA had no idea whatsoever what social media is all about. So um, my, my take on the whole thing is that it was very much a, a witch hunt from the word go. Daryl, you've had over 30 years of experience in uh, media. Um, when you look at uh, social media, when we look at the advancements in technology, we know that it comes um, at a price, obviously. Um, it is amazing what we can do and achieve as far as um, technology and social media is concerned these days. But it also comes at a price, does it not? It's the way we consume uh, media these days via the different platforms can be pretty dangerous. And it's also, apart from the way we consume the, 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 the content, it's also how we view it, how we understand it, and how we regurgitate it as well. Very much so. Um, if you think about it, journalists are trained in so many components to work in the media around issues such as uh, ethics, morals, the law, um, things uh, such as what you can say, what you can't say. Um, social media is very much a free-for-all. And the reality of the situation is that people who engage in social media are engaging on the media. Uh, and in the media. So in other words, what they should do, they should be well aware of the responsibilities. And there are very strong responsibilities about engaging in the media. Um, and I think more and more people need to realize that when they do engage in social media, that they should play by the same rules as mainstream media. And there are rules, there are laws um, that apply to anyone who engages in the media. 
And I think more people need to be aware of that. You have drawn similarities between uh, Tim Noakes's experience on social media with that of Helen Ziller, and you've alluded um, as such in your book. Talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, and that also obviously indicates that if you don't utilize social media in a responsible enough manner, you could truly get into a lot of hot water. Yes, but there again, I mean, what people must understand is that what makes social media social media is the feedback mechanism, the rebuke mechanism. So if someone says something, let's say, for example, it's a leading politician, uh, says something which people find offensive, then people react immediately. And that is that rebuke, that feedback mechanism. Um, and that is done in order to, um, in a way, sort of express opinion. So I think it's very strange that the... the People want that rebuke mechanism, so they, they want to have a voice and they want to say something if they feel um, that something has offended them. And then after that, they want to punish the person. So in other words, they've enjoyed the, the, the ability to, to challenge that person and then they want to punish them as well. You, you can't have both. You can't have social media and uh, at the same time enjoy all the fruits of social media, which is access to, to say something about someone, and then demand they be punished. It's, it just doesn't make sense to me. When you look at the events that unfolded after those tweets by Tim Noakes, um, obviously um, his reputation was damaged. Um, he tried to justify what he had said. And then out comes this book by you, Daryl Ilbury. Do you think that by way of the book, and I know the book is not only about Tim Noakes, there are lots of um, uh, comments by other personalities. There are other twists and turns in the book as well, which we'll talk about in a minute or two. But do you think that his reputation has been redeemed somewhat by way of the publishing of this book? I think if anything, um from the publication of this book, people should actually have the backstory. They should have the context to, to the whole thing. Um, and I did spend quite a bit of time um, analyzing and uh, analyzing the actual the, the tweet itself, obviously, and what went before it, what went after it. What's important is that in terms of guidelines around the world that apply to uh, health professionals, what Tim did, he's actually played a by the book. You must understand, this is a man who's actually been intimately involved in the media for over 40 years. He embraces social media, understands the responsibilities of social media, and he plays by the book. I mean, the, the, the rules around um, uh, social media use for health professions around the world focus on basically a handful of things. Uh, health professionals are not allowed to encourage uh, people to share personal information on social media. They're not allowed to try and do a diagnosis. They're also not allowed to encourage people to contact them privately because that is something called supersession, which is basically trying to steal uh, a patient away from another health professional. And so Tim Noakes did none of those things whatsoever, so he played things by the book. You've interviewed a host of famous South African celebrities um, and I think they've had a relationship of sorts with Tim Noakes. What did they say about the man? I think what was interesting is that I contacted and I spoke to a number of people who are vociferous opponents of Tim Noakes. And I didn't find one single person who was actually celebrating the fact that he was facing an HPCSA hearing. Um, I found no one, even those people who um, are quite vocal against Tim Noakes, who supported the HBCSA hearing. They all saw it as a waste of time and money. And they all said that they'd far rather engage with him as fellow professionals rather than to go through some kind of hearing like this. So that for me was interesting. But there again, when I analyzed a lot of the, the feedback on in the media, uh, there was a definite shift leading up to the actual uh, hearing. And in the first couple of, of weeks of the hearing, uh, there was uh, quite a lot of uh, sentiment against Tim Noakes, but after he gave evidence and he swung the whole thing around in his favor, then that seemed to basically drift away. And if you have a look at social media, 
um, sort of you use various filtering mechanisms to have a look at the, the tone of language in social media, you find that a significant portion of social media were, were for Tim Noakes. So it was very hard to find anyone who was actually working a, against him outside of his standard um, um, opponents. You talk about there being lots of twists and turns and surprises in the book, but without giving away too much, can you just share a little bit for the benefit of our viewers this morning? Yes, funny enough, when I wrote the book, um, I had to keep an open mind, but I still had my hypotheses, and, and many of those hypotheses were proven to be incorrect. Uh, one of them was that um, there was a certain element of Tim Noakes that he was, he was paranoid. And uh, a number of other journalists I spoke to, they felt exactly the same when they started doing research into and writing about him. But when I eventually get to, to finding out why he speaks so passionately, and why he seems to be so unscientific and uh, untethered in the way that he expresses his opinions, it's very powerful. And I finally do get it. I realize that what drives him is the fact that even though he's a qualified doctor, he never practiced as a doctor. But what has actually happened is working with so many people who have benefited from the Banting diet and have changed their life and changed their health. Um, he is beginning to see himself again as, as a doctor and, 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 and sort of more of a doctor than a, than, a, than a scientist. So people that he would normally see as a researcher, as subjects of his research, are becoming increasingly um, patients as, as a doctor. And it's that... It's that it's that human touch that he's actually uh, rekindled in his work with so many people that is actually what's driving him. And also I was shocked with how he actually felt about Claire Yulsing Stratum, who is the dietitian who, um, who laid, the claim, uh, laid the complaint against him that actually kick-started the HBCSA hearing. Believe it or not, he, he doesn't hate, he, he pities her. And that's, that's, I found that quite fascinating, really. Well, good for him. You know, I have interviewed him several times in the past and I found him to be an absolutely thorough gentleman. We will continue talking with Daryl Ilbury after this ad break, so do stay with us. Welcome back and in the final six minutes of the show today, we're still talking to Daryl Ilbury. He's the author of A Fox's Tale, but today we're talking to him about his book called The Quiet Maverick. And it's largely about Tim Noakes and the controversy around uh, the social media um, responses to queries on the Banting diet being suitable for children or not. Daryl has taken it upon himself to write the backstory of the trial of Tim Noakes. I just wonder what are your thoughts on it. Daryl, back to you, and I'm wondering who should and why should we be reading the book? That's a very good question. Um, I think um, I think everyone should read the book, obviously, but I think it's of special interest to people who want to take control of what they eat and how it affects their life. One of the things I point, in to, point to in the book is the relationship between what you eat and your health and um, what Tim Noakes has done. And I must point out the fact that uh, Tim Noakes is not on his own. He is part of, a, of an increasingly large uh, uh, core of uh, health professionals all the way around the world who are encouraging people who are diabetic or pre-diabetic or have a condition called insulin resistance to uh, shift their diet towards focusing more on cutting down in carbs and increasing their fats. And the science is strong to point uh, to, to the health benefits of cutting down in carbs and increasing the fat content. It is, it, it is to do with how the body processes food and especially around uh, the body's response to the input of food and how to break down the carbohydrates and how to break down the, the fats in order to generate um, uh, energy. Um, and I think there is uh, a high percentage of people, it seems to be a high percentage of people here in South Africa who are possibly insulin resistant. Um, if they uh, have a portfolio of conditions such as high blood pressure, um, high uh, levels of sugar in their blood, um, if they have a uh, large midriff 
And uh, if they display the conditions associated, normally associated with uh, diabetes, then they could be insulin resistant. So I think, um, I think most South Africans should have an opportunity to sit down, read the book, familiarize themselves with the science behind it, and realize that there are thousands of South Africans who have completely turned their, their health around simply by changing their diet. But there are people who are at a very specific condition. Daniel, there are some critics who suggest that the book is controversial. Why do you think they're saying that? It's controversial because it challenges a lot of what we um, think and how we uh, interact with science. There are various ways in which we've been brought up in terms of uh, culture and our belief systems that um, portray science negatively, especially where science challenges central tenets to, to our belief structures. And that's one of the reasons why, especially in South Africa, and it's very sad to, 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 to realize that, uh, that we have a very strained relationship with science. We, we embrace all the science that comes with technology and that kind of thing, but when science presents something which clashes with uh, any kind of, of belief system, then, um, then it's, it's, we, we, we run the risk of, of uh, not enjoying all the benefits of science. Having said that, as a science journalist, it is my responsibility to challenge science at every, every turn and not simply promote anything that, uh, that comes out of researchers. Daniel, you come from a psychological background and you've got a degree in psychology, but you are a science journalist. And people might be put off and think that this book is largely about science. Um, what would you say to them and how would you convince them to go ahead and read the book and that also it is an easy and an enjoyable read? That's a very good question again. Um, I, I wrote from the perspective of uh, someone who wants to reach to people who embrace science in every single part of their life and, and we all do. That's the thing about science. Science examines and it moves to improve every single aspect of our life. So when I wrote it, I had to bear that in mind. I had to encourage people to realize that. But I wrote it with the eye on the non-specialist reader. So what I've done is I've introduced strange and fascinating and larger-than-life characters. I've tried to make it as entertaining as possible. Um, I've drawn on my um, experience in, in um, breakfast radio for over 25 years. So um, I've I've tried to incorporate all those skills and tell a great story. And I think what's important is the fact that the narrative is there. So hopefully when you start reading it, you get carried along, you get to the end of, of a chapter and it teases to the next chapter. And you think, well, let's go on to the next chapter. And next thing you know, you've read the book. So I've written it in a way that people should find it easy to engage and, and hopefully go along and enjoy the ride. And finally, Daryl, the book is about Tim Noakes, and yet they're part of the book that has absolutely nothing to do with Tim Noakes. Why did you kind of uh, follow that style of writing? Uh, Tim Noakes is the central character, but uh, if this was a play, it has a cast of thousands. And it's uh, every single person who sits down, consumes media, and, and engages with the, the food that they eat, and who see the link between what they eat and their health. I think what's important is the fact that they are the bulk of the, the, the players in, in this play. So whereas he may be the lead actor and his name is on the billboard, at the end of the day, it's about the person who sits down and reads the book. And that's where we leave it. Fascinating talking to you. Lots and lots of success with the sale of the book. And I have no doubt that there is another book in the pipeline. Best of regards to Tim Noakes as well. Thank you for being with, with us on the show this morning. And Thank you, of course, we say goodbye to Daryl Ilbury. I'm signing off now. Thank you for being with me. Till the next time, as always, it is Hoda Fez from me, Julie Ali. <laughs> Yeah, hello, 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 y